and welcome to Life Point Church. We're so happy to see you this morning, whether you're in person or online. If this is your first time coming, we hope that it won't be your last, and we look forward to getting to know you. In order to do that, you can text hello to this number. We just want you to know that Jesus cares about you, and so do we. Welcome to Life Point. Church, let's worship. Sweet. 
I've been thinking about time And where does it go? How can I stop my life from passing me by? I don't know I've been thinking about family You know it's going so fast Where I wake up one morning just wishing that I could go back I've been thinking about lately, maybe I could make a change and let you change me So with all of my heart, this is my prayer Singing up in the morning or search my heart don't let me stray i just want to stay where you are all i got is one shot one try one go around in this beautiful life nothing is wasted when everything's placed in your hands about heaven and the promise you hold so it's all eyes on you until that day you call me home singing oh lord keep me in the moment help me live with my eyes wide open cause i don't want to miss what you have for me. i don't want to miss i don't want to miss you 
take our weakness You've set your treasures in jars of clay So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel The world to see your life in me Oh, amazing grace, how sweet Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day. Uh, I pray that uh, you'll bring unity to everybody and that you'll uh, teach us how to love one another and, and think about one one another instead of ourselves first and that you'll instill that in us and that we'll rely solely on, on your thoughts and for everything that you are and not man. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, LifePoint friends and family. We're so happy that you're here with us today. And if this is your first time joining, we would love to connect with you. So if you could please text hello to the number on the screen and a member of our church can introduce themselves. Also, if you are in need of a moment of prayer, you can text prayer to the same number and a member from our church will join you for confidential prayer. Enjoy the service. We're happy to see you. I recently uh, wanted to watch a movie, and uh, I started going through reviews just to look at some uh, different movies, and uh, uh, a, um, a feed just popped up that I couldn't resist clicking on, and uh, it said the 20 most used or overused lines in cinema, 
And uh, so I jumped in and started looking at them, and I could recognize, you know, quite a number of them. I think you can imagine some of them, you know, the usual, I'll be back, and uh, things like, it's going to blow, you know. Uh, but one of them caught my eye because uh, it's uh, an area that I had just been thinking and meditating on, and it's one that says, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And I like that phrase because it sort of gives a sense of choice, but in truth, what it's really saying, there's only one realistic way to do things, and typically, even though it might be called the easy way, there's probably nothing easy about it. Well, that phrase and that sort of harsh reality has been popularized uh, through phrases like this in cinema, but it's not a new concept. In fact, Jesus himself uh, made a statement uh, that, uh, that was, you know, said a similar, was expressed or communicated a similar, a, a similar thing. And uh, these are the words he wrote or he spoke to his followers um, at the time. And he said, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Now, if you're saying I didn't quite get that because I have no idea what a yoke is, well, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's what a yoke looks like. Oops, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, that's what a yoke looks like. <laughs> and probably your next question might be, you know, uh, what is it used for? And that's what it's used for. It brings two animals together. So as it were, you get, um, you know, two cylinders instead of one on your motor and you're able to pull a little bit harder. And uh, that's, what, that's what it's used for. But you can see if you're yoked to something or someone, uh, you better be planning to get along with them uh, because you're going to be working together for a while. Well, uh, the word burden as well is not uh, a commonly used uh, term or, or, or word in our vocabulary these days, uh, but it refers to a load and typically a very heavy load. Uh, and uh, if you're two animals yoked, yoked together, it's typically the load that you're, you're pulling or the, the cart that you're drawing, which is typically heavy. That's why you've been yoked to pull it. Or if you were to think in terms of a person, it would be a, a very heavy load that they are carrying that weighs them down. And so, you know, when Jesus says, for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you, give you is light, you could actually, in fact, call this statement what is known as an oxymoron, right? It's, uh, it has contradictory terms. There is nothing easy about a yoke. You just saw what it looks like and what it's used for. And also, the very definition of a burden is that it's heavy. And so Jesus is saying the burden I give you is light. So what is he really communicating to us? Well, let's go two verses back. Let's go to verse 28 of this scripture. Uh, where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So this little message he gives is really an invitation. He's inviting those who are listening to him to come because they are weary of the, the yoke the yoke they're carrying or the yoke they have put on them and the burdens they're carrying are very heavy. So he's saying there's a relative scale of, of, of yoke and of burden. And so then he continues in 29, take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your soul. So now he offers his yoke. And he concludes with that, uh, those, those words, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, there are two things he's implying here, and I think I mentioned them very briefly. First of all, that we are all yoked to something. We're all yoked to something. Because he's saying, take my yoke. He's saying, replace the yoke you have with mine. And he's also saying there's a scale. There's a difficulty that depends on what yoke you've put on yourself. Now, if I asked you what, uh, what, you know, what is your idea of a yoke, you might say, I'm yoked to my job. Uh, maybe I'm yoked to my family or my spouse. I'm yoked to uh, my mortgage. You know, these are things that we might say we are yoked to, but I think those are all on the surface. In truth, it's a little bit deeper than that. Jesus is really talking about something deeper. And let me use an illustration to, 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 uh, to explain it. Say you have two people working in the same place, doing exactly the same job. Now, um, it's, it's a tough job, but they're both doing the same thing. 
they could both say, I am yoked to my job. The other person, I'm yoked to my job. And you might say it's the same yoke. Well, let's put a contrast in there. What if the first person is in there because of the pay, because of the benefits, because of the commute? What if the other person is there because they have a passion for that type of work? They believe that they are making a difference in the lives of people. They believe that they're, they're, that's their mission, that's their calling. Are they the same yoke? No, I think one yoke is easier than the other one. And so, yokes are really the worldviews and the faith and belief systems that we hold on to. The motivations and the inner desires we have. The way we perceive things and the way we process our thoughts and the observations we make when we hear things and see things and also our conscience and other things. These are the deep yokes that we have that have driven us to those decisions we've made. And so the yoke is not the job. The yoke is what led you to that job. The yoke is not the family or the spouse. It's what led you to that person to have a lifetime commitment with them. The yoke is, is really what is coming from inside you. And I think uh, similarly, we could say uh, that Jesus is implying that we all have burdens. All of us all have burdens of one type or the other. Because he says uh, all that have carry heavy burdens, he's really addressing all of us. And he's saying also, like I said, the heaviness depends on what the burden is and what you're carrying. It means there's also a scale. It's not just a burden is a burden. Now, again, I could ask what comes in mind when you think of burdens. And you might think if you go to the job, well, it's those long hours that I have to work. Or you might say it's a child or a grandchild that is struggling through issues and I have the burden of, of working with them. Or it's someone I'm helping with some issue to go through, whether it's health or financial or something else. That's a burden that I have. Or you might say, it's my loan payments. Those are my burdens. Again, those again just appear at the surface. The burdens are really the outcomes of the yokes that we have. That's what we end up pulling. And so the burdens are all these things. Fear, the concerns, with the doubts, worries, anxieties. And I think if you look at a list like this, it really does tell you that we, we, even today, right here, there are things that we can identify with that we are carrying, whether maybe an anxiety or, or some discomfort or something that is not quite right in your life. And so, Jesus is inviting us. And I think two of the invitations are very clearly stated in this passage. And then there are two others that are implied, and I'll go through all four invitations, and I'll go through them using the illustration of an animal that's yoked. Now, what happens initially when you yoke an animal? You take a young calf, okay, this looks like he's going to be able to pull some good heavy loads. Let's put a yoke on him. What happens initially? He is restless, very restless. He's going to do everything he can to shake it off. And I think that's the first invitation that Jesus extends to us. He's inviting us to rest. He says in Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He's offering us rest. Rest from what? Well, from all these things that we looked at, all of these burdens that we are carrying, all of this heaviness that we have. And what I love about the way Jesus presents this is he doesn't say, come to me and you'll never have another worry in your life. No, he says, come to me, I'm going to put a yoke on you. Come to me, I'm going to give you a burden. But he's saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I think if you look at these things and things, what are the opposites of these? And what, are, what, what allows us or helps us to work through these things? Well, when we are yoked to Jesus, we give our life to him, and he pours into us his spirit. And I think recently, we've, uh, our pastor has walked through some of the fruit of the spirit here. Love, peace, patience, self-control, gentleness, kindness. Do those things come free? No, they don't. If you are having unconditional love for someone, regardless of how they are treating you, there is a price to it. There's a price to it. But what Jesus is saying is that that burden is much lighter than carrying this stuff. 
Is it easy to be kind when others are unkind to you? No, it's not. But Jesus says that burden is lighter than carrying anger or bitterness. Is self-control easy? No, it's not. And so, this is really not something new. If you dial back from Matthew to the Psalms, which were written by uh, King David uh, hundreds of years before, he wrote, he wrote in Psalm 55, 22, give your burdens to the Lord. This concept is not new. Shed all this stuff and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. Because yes, we shall slip and fall if we hold on to all of that stuff. What ends up happening? It doesn't just cause us mental and emotional anguish. It eventually begins to cause us physical harm. And it will kill us if we are not careful. And so he's saying, let them go. Don't hold on to those things. I have a much lighter burden for you. And how does he give us rest? I think he also in the New Testament we read uh, in 1 Peter 5, 7 that give all of your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. This is something we are continually encouraged to do in the Bible. And how does Jesus give us rest? Well, he's telling us in Romans 12, 12 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. It's going to, it takes a, a different thought process. It's a different mindset. Then you will be able to, to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. This is how he begins to give us rest by us seeing things in a new way. He also gives us rest by helping us to be content. What happens when we, are, when we have the wrong yoke on us? We are discontent. We continually look and see other people with other yokes and we think, oh, well, perhaps that's a better yoke to take and we take it and we find it doesn't bring any fulfillment. It doesn't bring any contentment. But once we are yoked with Jesus and we have true godliness, then we start to find contentment because like the previous scripture says, we start to find our place and we start to realize that we can be comfortable with who we are and what we have. Now, after an animal has been yoked and the, the owner has worked to make it rest and it now realizes that it's not going to get choked, nothing's going too badly, uh, you can just rest with this yoke, what's the next step? Well, he has to teach it how to use the yoke. He, the, the, the animal has to learn. And similarly, the second invitation Jesus extends to us is to learn. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I don't want to be yoked with someone who runs a lot faster than I or runs too slowly or runs in all kinds of directions. I mean, imagine being yoked to, I don't know, Hussein Bolt and trying to do a 100-meter dash with him. You end up dragged down the, uh, down the tracks. Jesus says, I am gentle and humble in heart. He knows specifically what is the best pace for you whether financially, whether relationship-wise, in every aspect of your life, he knows the perfect pace for you. And he's going to walk with you and get you to where you're going in the most perfect way. Now, I think it was a few months ago, I came across a very interesting article in the Journal of Science. And uh, it was uh, an article summarizing the study of quite a number of scientists ar around the world. And they were looking at how the human mind develops uh, cognitive skills compared to primates. And so they took a bunch of, uh, I think there were about 100 chimps and like uh, 50 orangutans. And uh, they wanted to compare their cognitive skill capabilities with, with, the, with the cognitive skills of humans. But obviously, they've had to find an age of humans that they could make a fair comparative study. So they chose toddlers, and so they included 100 toddlers, uh, two-year-olds, in the study. Now, the initial tests were all around, uh, around spatial awareness uh, and also uh, quantities and computation, causality, which is cause and effect. And as they went through all of these tests, no difference whatsoever. Everybody was average. They all did equally well. 
And so you could say the primates or the chimps were doing as well as the, as the kids, the toddlers, or maybe if you want to look at it the other way, the toddlers were doing as well as the chimps, um, until they went to another series of tests that tested communications and social learning. And uh, that's where the difference just immediately came up. All the toddlers went towards the 100%. All the chimps were probably, and the, and the orangutans were probably about zero. And one test, for example, was, uh, in fact, when I, when I came in and, and they gave me my gear uh, for, the, for, for the mic, uh, you know, it was in a plastic box, and I had to figure out how to pop, up, pop out the lid. Well, what they did to each of these subjects, they put their favorite snack or a toy inside a, a plastic box, and they showed them how to pop it open. And the toddlers observed once, and they went right for the box. Once the snack was put back in there, they popped it open, and they were able to get their toy. With almost all the primates, they tried to tear the box open or smash it apart. Uh, they, they just couldn't, that learning couldn't transfer. Because part of that learning is intent. Why is it being done? It's not just the how. There's a connection there. And so the finding of this study was that we are, what really sets us apart is our social learning, our ability to learn and communicate with each other. And really, this is the core of this scripture. It's saying, don't copy the behavior customs of this world, but let God transform you. You see, the downside of being such good learners is that we also learn so many bad things. We learn so many bad things. And so even, you remember earlier I mentioned, we all have a yoke. Well, we might want to say, these are my principles. I am my own person. These are my own ideas. No, they're not. You've picked them up from somewhere. It's just that you've collected them and taken ownership of them. But you see, the upside of being such good learners is that it doesn't matter what age we are. We are reprogrammable. We can be transformed. We can be changed. All it takes is our acknowledgement that there's something wrong with us. We are the only ones on this planet who can self-look back at ourselves and say, no, I'm not right. I'm not happy with this. I'm not satisfied with this. I'm not content. I want a change. And this is the beauty of the gospel. It simply comes and says, look at yourself more closely. Look at your sin. Look at the issues in your life. But there's one person who can change all that, and his name is Jesus Christ. And all you need to do is be yoked to you, to him, and he will transform you, helping you change the way you think. And then what happens? Because he's moving at your speed, he's humble and gentle of heart, you start to be everything that you are called to be. You start to understand your mission. You start to understand your purpose. And you start to, to shine and to do things in a remarkably new way, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. There's a scripture, I think it's Psalm 37 verse 4, that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. What it's saying, if you're yoked to Jesus Christ, you delight yourself in him, he will truly allow you to find your true expression of yourself, to find your calling, to find your mission, to find your purpose. And when you find that, it is good, it is pleasing, and it is perfect. Well, how do we learn? Well, first by reading and studying the Bible. This is something we have to do for ourselves as well. It is good to have it read for you, but let me tell you what, when you read it, because each of us is individually yoked to Jesus Christ as well, we start to understand certain things in a very specific way for ourselves. There is a unique revelation of the Word of God for each individual. Because you, only you have specific circumstances, a specific thought process, a specific way to understand things, and that's how we are able to learn. So we have to read and study the Bible as a group, but also individually. We have to pray, to come to God and pray, not just to ask him for stuff, but to be able to listen to him. What is he speaking to us after we talk to him? to also pour out some of our concerns and say, we, I can't figure this out, Lord. Help me with it. 
How about participating in life groups? I just said we are great social learners. The most effective way to learn the Word of God and to grow spiritually is as a group. We are designed to work in groups. And so when you're in a, in a group setting, you're able to appreciate how other people have, have struggled through their own circumstances, how they have understood certain uh, principles and, and, and concepts in the Bible, how they have applied those in their lives. And we start to see some similarities, but also some differences, and we get some insights that we can apply uniquely to our own lives. It is crucial there is no closet Christian, as they say. You can't lock yourself in a room, read the Bible, pray to God, and say you're a Christian. Being a Christian means being a member of the body of Christ, as it's called. And the body of Christ is a family. It's a family of people. And when we are family of people, yes, we can gather as a church like this, but the unique thing about life groups is you're able to come together in a unique setting with a specific group of people who have some common interests, some common thoughts, or common age, or age group, whatever it is that holds you together, even if it is only your love for Jesus Christ. We can learn through Sunday messages and a lot of resources related to that. Here at the church physically, there are a lot of, there's a lot of physical media in way of Bibles and devotions and other things that we can learn through. But online, there is also the digital media that is available and accessible. Only, you only need ask. And it's all available there for you, whether messages, whether some teachings, uh, devotions, uh, and so on and so on. We also learn through serving because when we serve, we start to understand more about ourselves and the calling that God has for us individually. This is how we learn. Now, after an animal's been yoked, it's rested, and then it learns, okay, this is how this thing works. What's the next step? Well, it enters into a life of service. Now it's time for the owner to get back the investment he made. It enters into a life of service, and that's the third area or third invitation we have. It's the invitation to serve. Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, as he described himself, came not to be served, but to serve others. He is the ultimate servant. He gave his life. He didn't need to, but he gave his life so that we can have life and have a true life and an abundant life. He came not to be served, but to serve others. And that's why he tells us in Matthew 23, 11, that the greatest among us is the one who serves. This is really our highest calling. When we figure out who we are because we have been transformed through the renewal of our minds, as we read in Romans 12, 2, we now can serve and serve joyfully. We can serve with, with, with delight in knowing that we are accomplishing the mission and the purpose for which we were created. And where do we serve and how do we serve? Well, we, we can serve in our homes just with showing love and extend kindness to one another. We can serve at work in, in being the type of people that we know God would want us to be. Being able to recognize things that are wrong and call them for what they are. Being able to step away from conversations that we know are not right. Being able to uh, do all we can to, to, to show that we are truly transformed. We serve in church. If you received the latest bulletin or through email, there were more than 30 ways in which you can serve here at LifePoint Church. We serve in public when we're able to be patient and exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. In those long queues, we don't complain, we, don't, we, we, demo, we, we demonstrate and show behaviors that help people to understand who we are. Wherever we are, we are called to serve. Now, an animal goes through a, a, a lifetime of service. What's next? Well, it's now time for it to step into the lead role and help the newcomer who is yoked to be able to find rest and to learn how to use the yoke. And that's the fourth invitation that Jesus is extending to us. He's asking us to invite others. We are being invited to invite Jesus said, 
before he ascended into heaven. This was his message to his disciples, Matthew 28, 19, 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's a call to every one of us. We have been called to invite others, to draw others to Jesus Christ. Why? Because just as we were in difficulty, just as we were carrying heavy burdens, just as we were incorrectly yoked, there are so many out there, and there are some that only you are called to go and reach out to. Only you. Because you are in their setting or you have crossed paths, there's a way that God helps us interact with other people, meet with other people, intersect lives with other people so that we can touch their lives and be a blessing to them. And so you might say, well, I'm not good at handing out tracts or going around uh, spread, what, you know, talking about the word of God. Well, how about just starting by modeling Christ-like behavior in what we do? That's a, that's, that's a very easy one. I remember about 10 years ago at work, I had uh, uh, one of my colleagues come over and say, Paul, are you a Christian? And I said, yes, I am. Why did you ask? And he said, well, it's just the way you behave, the way you treat other people. Uh, I think you're a Christian. Now, I was happy he had probably seen me at some of my good moments because it's not all the time that he probably would have said I'm a Christian. But uh, I thanked God that he had had that opportunity to see that. And it helped me start to observe people. And I started noticing there are many Christians at work. It's not only, I may have said, oh gosh, maybe I might not want everyone to know that I'm a Christian and, uh, you know, I used to, I, I had a, a Bible on my bookshelf there, but, you know, that's, that's about all that probably was physically observable. But uh, I started to realize that there are people who do model Christ-like behavior. And so we started talking with this uh, gentleman, and uh, after that we shared, and he told me uh, you know, about their Bible study, and we'd have regular chats. And that was almost 10, 11 years ago when we worked in the same department, and after that we didn't work at all. Uh, you know, I didn't see him again. Until a few weeks ago, he contacted me and he said, uh, Paul, I've been, asked to, uh, you know, I, I, I've been asking to serve in a greater capacity at our church, and they were saying they needed someone to give a reference and preferably someone you worked with. And of course I said yes, because we had had these discussions and had gotten to know that he was a Christian and he was, he was someone that uh, really loved uh, Jesus and, and uh, was, was, was confident and happy in his faith. We can share our testimony. One of the, very, the most convincing ways that you can reach out to someone is just to share your life experience and why you became a Christian. It's very effective because it's, it's, it's genuine. It's, it, people can see that some, something happened to you and, and they're able to relate to it and they connect with that. Yes, we can share the good news directly. Sometimes we're called to do that. We're called to maybe pass on a, a tract or to just tell people about the good news of Jesus. But how about serving in the church? And why do I add that there? Yes, you might not be at the front line of inviting others, but I can tell you that whatever you do makes it possible for someone else to invite others. And so it's one way that we can indirectly support someone in missions, support those that do the invitations and reach out to other people. There are many, many ways that we can serve. And so today, Jesus is inviting us you and I, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, then whatever you're yoked to will continue to make you restless. And I can say that rest doesn't mean that every difficulty or burden goes away. And that's the beauty of the way Jesus presents this passage we've looked at. He says, you still have a yoke, and that's him, and you still have a burden. The things he asks us to do are not easy. But I can tell you, as we do them, they become easier because we are confident that he's with us. See, when you're yoked to, when a young animal is yoked to a, uh, the, the, the master of, of the yoke, he doesn't have to pull that hard. He just might just need to follow. And that's what Jesus is saying. I'll do the heavy lifting for you. I'll prepare the other person's heart. Just go and apologize. I will prepare the way forward for you. Just take, just take your initiative. Have the right attitude we can find rest in him. 
For those of us who have given our lives to Jesus Christ, we also need rest. We all very often start to lose perspective and we start to yoke ourselves to the wrong things. We start to have the wrong perspectives about things. And all he's asking us is come back and just really revisit the yoke that I have given you and be yoked to me and I will help you walk through all of those difficult things and those burdens that you may be carrying. He's asking us or inviting you to learn from him. Learn from him. Pray, read the word of God and be encouraged. He's asking us to serve. There are so many opportunities, as, that are, as I said, that we have to serve God through the church, in our homes, wherever we are. Let's see ourselves as having been transformed to enter a life of service. And also, he's inviting us to invite others to him. Ultimately, this is how we fulfill our mission and we end our mission here on earth, is by ensuring that we are continually inviting others to know the good news. There are many parables, there are several parables in the Bible that talk about someone finding something good. Now, when you find something good, you don't go in a corner and giggle and you're all happy about it. No, you go and tell your friends, look at this. This is great. I found this. I'm happy about this. If we are truly happy about having been yoked to Jesus Christ and having been transformed, we should be happy to talk about it. And so Jesus is inviting you. Have you responded? And if not, will you respond? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great love for us. It is in, not describable in words, the, the type of love you have for us individually. You have created us. We are your children. You want the best for us. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to come and die for our sins. And we thank you for the invitation that he extends to us to find rest, that all of the burdens we carry in our homes, in our own lives, and all the messy things that are around us and within us, may we just bring them to you and say, we want to exchange these for your yoke, for your burdens. Thank you for inviting us to learn and to be able to know more about what you desire in our lives. Transform us by the renewal of our minds so that we can truly understand your will for us, which is good, which is pleasing and perfect. Thank you for inviting us to serve. May we each find our place of service. May we each find our footing here on earth so that when our time comes to leave this earth, we can have done all that you called us to do and find joy in it. Thank you for inviting us to invite others. May we never miss an opportunity to share your love through modeling the behavior and the perfect life of your son, Jesus Christ, whenever we can. And when we fail, forgive us. Help us to invite others by sharing our testimonies. And help us to always invite others by serving and allowing others around us to use the gifts that you have given them as we use ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father's house. 